why don't you commit crime? Or if you do, why do you? Well, what would the people you care about think if you were arrested or maybe even spent time in prison? Would they be shocked and disappointed? Or would they think it was kind of cool? Edwin Sutherland thinks that it's the opinion of these people that has the biggest influence on if you would actually commit a crime. Meaning, do you belong to a culture that is pro or anti-criminal? Psychboost.com, over 170 videos to help you with your qualification, and Patreon supporters can access bonus resources, tutorial videos, and the Discord channel. Sutherland created the term differential association, and he completely rejected biological ideas around offending, instead of looking at the cultural pressures of people involved in criminal activity. Criminality is participation in a cultural tradition, and as a result of association with representatives of that culture. What Sutherland means by this is criminality and non-criminality is learnt from the people who surround us. We know this as socialization. We learn norms and values of society from our community, our parents, our friends, and hopefully even teachers. But each one of us has a different set of people around us who socialize us. This is the differential association. Criminals are socialized too, but the people around them teach deviant norms and values from the rest of society. That's because some of the people around them hold pro-criminal attitudes. The more people around them with pro-criminal attitudes, and the more extreme those attitudes, the more likely the individual will go on to commit crime. And we can use the idea of reinforcement here. The people around us provide social approval and disapproval for our actions. Criminals will approve of the criminal behaviour of others. And a part of differential association theory is not just picking up the pro-criminal attitudes, but learning actual offending techniques. These are passed down from generations or across peer groups. A father might teach his son how to pick a lock or a businessman might teach his friend how to cheat on the taxes. Reinforcement also works beyond approval. Criminals often receive material benefits from committing crimes and might see these rewards as better than potential rewards from not offending in their community. Evaluations. Most of what we've looked at in this unit explains violent crime, but Sutherland literally wrote the book on what is known as white collar crime. This is non-violent crime that's committed by high-status, respectable business people and people who work in the government. One interesting aspect then of differential association is it explains both violent and this white-collar crime. In some peer groups, bank robbery is acceptable. But for others, bank robbery would be completely wrong. But defrauding millions from a bank in a scam or paying the government bribes for billions in contracts is fine because, well... Everyone else they know does it. There are real practical applications to this theory. Firstly, don't put first-time offenders with experienced criminals together in prison. I mean, that would effectively be a criminal university, with older criminals passing on pro-criminal attitudes and techniques. Secondly, go into communities with pro-criminal attitudes and try to change the narrative, perhaps by trying to offer alternate rewarding opportunities that don't involve a criminal activity. Sutherland's work was a complete rejection of the idea of born criminals. In 1930s America, genetic ideas about criminality were used to perform racially motivated forced sterilization. This was on criminals and members of racial groups, so they couldn't pass on what were considered to be criminal genes, a policy known as eugenics. Remember Lombroso? But it's not all positive evaluations. One major problem is, in reality, people are most likely to cause criminal offences if they're male and in late adolescence to early adulthood. And this makes no sense according to differential association theory, as older males will have had more socialising experience, so exposure to pro-criminal attitudes. And males and females are socialised in the same household and exposed to the same attitudes. But it's the males who statistically go on to commit the crime. Finally, any evidence in this area is going to be correlational. There is no easy way to separate the genetic and social influences. And it might actually be that people who are genetically likely to become criminals seek out other people with criminal attitudes to socialise with. And this is a process called niche picking. Here is a real forensic exam question on differential association theory. 
And I want to give a quick thank you to everybody who supports the channel over on Patreon. A quick reminder, if you're a Psychboost patron and the Neuron level and above, you can access six forensic tutorial videos over on psychboost.com. I'll talk you through a model answer for the exam question and give you some general exam tips. Synapse patrons can access a printable forensic poster, a 90 question quiz sheet covering the unit and an essay table, and for everybody else, don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss the videos released right to exams. And I'll see you in the next Psychboost video. Psychodynamic explanations of offending behavior.